Okay. Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending uh, my presentation and talk today. And I feel very proud and privileged to be uh, sharing the stage with a lot of other thought, you know, uh, leaders in this space. And I want to thank RSA for hosting this RSA conference. Um, I have a little anecdote that I want to share. Last year, I came over here with uh, a lot of other folks that I know from the past. Uh, one of my old fellow, fellow co-worker was presenting um, in a time slot that was also uh, conflict with the NSA talk. And I made a joke, you know, make fun of him saying that, oh, everyone's going to attend your NSA Rob Joyce's, you know, speech. Um, and to my luck, to karma, there is a panel hosted by NSA right at this slot. Um, so I understand if, if a lot of people might be, you know, preferring that one as well. But to my luck, you know, Rob Joyce is hosting that panel. Um, he's not presenting. And also, I feel like I dodged the bullet by uh, not being in the same slot as Bruce Schneier's keynote, which is going to be right after this one, right? So I feel kind of blessed. Um, so um, let's start with the um, disclaimer. Um, you know, this is my personal uh, re you know, views on a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Doesn't reflect any of my current or previous employers or anyone, you know, including RSA. So this is standard legal stuff to uh, tell you that you know, some, of my some of my views over here can be kind of considered like heterodox or unorthodox to a certain degree. And I was kind of like you know, concerned about that till last minute, up until to the point that you know, CISA launched Zero Trust Measured Model 2.0 on April 11th. And I feel like most of my views are validated you know, and confirmed in that uh, measured model, which I have uh, added like two more, two or maybe three slides to the end. And we're, gonna, we're going to be talking about that Zero Trust Measured Model 2.0 towards the end of the presentation. And feel free to interrupt any time that if you have any questions. We were going to reserve like five plus minutes for, uh, uh, for Q&A. But if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will prefer having an interactive session. So um, I have been an active contributor to open source space, uh, delivering talks in mostly in Europe, uh, honeypots, situation awareness, um, full packet capture, in a bunch of um, um, DevOps, DevSecOps events. But most, uh, uh, mostly, I was actively working in professionally in FinTech space. I work for FICO, I work for WPP, and more recently with ADP, and now I'm with Roche. Although Roche is not in FinTech space, so many regulations are, are relevant. Um, and I feel lucky uh, and privileged to work for these large enterprises. They are so large that you know, one of them has 60,000 employees. My Roche, Roche, my current employer, has over 100,000 employees. And if you are working for these enterprises, large enterprises, you end up interacting, with, or as a DevSecOps person, you end up interacting with um, thousands or maybe tens of thousands of developers. The number is so large that you can't call them like developer community. We call them developer population. There are so many of them. And the law of physics ch starts changing after certain scale. Right? Um, sometimes they call it more is different, um, scale dependent complexity or scaling phenomena. And you know, I'm using these terms from uh, uh, physics education. And you might have seen so many slides, so many presentations in RSA conference are talking about quantum, quantum cryptography. And uh, even there's a session, a keynote from Michio Kaku, Dr. Michio Kaku. I guess it's tomorrow, actually, actually today at 4 p.m. So a lot of physics references in my talk, and I hope that it's going to resonate well with you. Um, you know, uh, we're going to look at some of the unique characteristics of how to implement DevSecOps for these uh, big enterprises. All right. So uh, I have like 37 slides, two minutes each. Um, you know, we're going to be high, you know, talking about on a high, very high level, evolution of DevSecOps. It started with the DevOps, now it, we call it DevSecOps. We're going to, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be talking about some of the interesting observations that I had uh, uh, observed in the past. Uh, one of them is classified as DIY effects. We're going to talk about CVE versus CWE, security as a code versus policy as code. And I'm going to try to coin the term, you know, trying to, I'm going to you know, give you a new definition of DevSecOps. It's uh, coordinated chaos, in my personal opinion, or we, can, we call it sometimes precision guesswork. And as I mentioned, two more slides, two slides at the end for Zero Trust Measures Model 2.0. Right. 
So uh, this is very, you know, standard DevOps infinity loop, right? Uh, and I see people are taking a picture of this. You know, it's one of those more, most famous uh, infinity loops out there. And it's not even called DevSecOps. You know, uh, as you know, DevOps, uh, DevSecOps has its own rules in DevOps. It started around like 2011, 2012 as an answer to how to automate a lot of things, how to automate things in a way that the developers can own some of the ops pieces. That's why the term is DevOps, right? So you kind of have to shift left some of the ops responsibilities towards developers so that they can codify using Ansible, using Terraform, using Jenkins file, Groovy, whatever you want to call them, so that they codify some of the infrastructure or ops responsibilities, right? This is the first iteration of our uh, you know, new pattern emerging, like started around, around 2012. The second iteration of DevSecOps is actually introducing Sec into the DevSecOps. This is from 2017, is from Gartner, and there's another one around the same time, 2019, that's slightly different. Now we see like the Dev and Sec responsibilities in the middle, and we have the Ops piece. And around the same time the DevSecOps Infinite tool loops started to appear. We started having that, that you know, what are we doing over here? What is the intention of creating this, you know, uh, that pictures, these beautiful infinity loops? We, we are trying to shift left, giving responsibility of doing security to the people who were not involved before, or even the ops, as I mentioned in the first slide. So this is the second iteration, right? And it's still valid for a lot of enterprises. You know, you might be, you know, adopting, or you might be trying to adopt this, this one. And around 2019, DOD, Department of Defense, launched their DevSecOps initiative, right? Uh, you know, they launched DevSecOps reference documents. Uh, most likely you guys have attended a lot of talks yesterday and today. Some of them are mentioning, you know, there was a lot of people from DOD, uh, CISA. They are referring to this infinite loop uh, nowadays. You know, it started around 2019, it's getting traction every passing day. And you might notice that there are, hold on, you see? There is one inner loop over here, which is what we used to call DevSecOps. Right, that there is dev, there is sec, and there is ops. And over here we have an outer, outer loop, right, which we call parallel or shadow pipeline. So you see the thread modeling, every, you know, you know uh, uh, pen testing, digital signing, uh, audits, and everything is another and external infinity loop, tightly around the inner loop. So what this tells us that you know, after a certain degree, um, you know, once you start having um, um, uh, in progress with your DevOps slash DevSecOps journey, you will going to quickly realize, especially if you're in a bigger organizations like DOD or ADP or Roche, my, based on my previous experience, uh, the laws of physics starts to change. You can't simply ask developers to own the previous slide, right? You can't simply ask, hey guys, own this developers, because there are a lot of teams, there are a lot of startups that are, that are smaller, they have like 50 or less developers slash ops people owning a lot of stuff. You can, you can essentially ask them to own everything to fullest. If you have a bigger organization, you end up creating a dedicated pipeline and a dedicated team just to own that piece. We are going to talk about that in, in, in coming slides. You know, especially this, this external loop that I'm referring to is, is classified as security as code or policy as code pipeline. And one of the reasons that there was an evolution that, you know, uh, that happened, started around 2012 till today, that uh, there was forces of evolution in effect. Because the definition of DevOps you know, transformed into DevSecOps for a lot of reasons. If you look at last 10 years, you're going to quickly realize that you know, around the same time frame that we see this evolution, zero trust become a became a thing, right? Zero trust kind of says don't trust anyone, including developers, which kind of contradicts with what DevSecOps is trying to do. You give a lot of responsibility to Dev they own security in addition to their development functions, development responsibilities, which we're going to talk about that as well. We, we see zero trust becoming more and more visible. We see cloud adoption slash infrastructure as a code becoming a thing, right? Ansible, Terraforms, cloud formations, uh, um, you know, um, cross planes, whole nine yards, all YAML files, Kubernetes manifest, Helm shells, et cetera. Those are all infrastructure as a code or configuration as a code. We want to call them, whatever you want to call them. And we also see containers becoming a thing, right? That also had an effect on this evolution that we are seeing. It's one of those you know, forces of the evolution. 
And you know, you quickly notice that you know, because of these different interpretations of what their circles mu must look like, uh, you can easily say one size fits all. If you try to add up one of the, you know, uh, if you go Google and start typing what is DevOps, what is DevSecOps, you're going to start seeing a lot of materials produced or you know, developed by small scale organizations. I don't want to pity on them. I don't want to you know, classify them as small or big. But their laws of physics is a lot different for large organizations, especially if you are in large organization space. Uh, do not assume that the experiences or best practices derived from the startup ecosystem, which are innovative in so many ways, are going to, going to be applicable to you, right? A lot of things change, and it becomes one size fits none problem. So um, this is one of my key slides. So I just want to talk about this briefly. Uh, has anyone heard this DIY effect term? Perfect, perfect. So my ADP, ex-ADP colleagues knows you know, uh, what I'm referring to. So to, truth is really pure and never simple, right? So I'm a DIYer myself. I just want to give you a personal story. I have a, yeah, it is, it is real. I'm, you know, most, of, most likely you guys know, you, I, I spend like maybe like three hours uh, a week on Home Depot and Lowe's. I'm going over remodeling, you know, exercise of my home, uh, ranch home, ranch home in New Jersey. And I started, you know, like building my own deck. And in order to do that, I started watching a lot of YouTube videos. I started watching a lot of, uh, reading a lot of uh, expert pieces. And I know that, you know, based on that information provided to me, I feel confident that I should be able to do all of that, right? And I got all the parts. I go to Home Depot, I bought all of, all, all the, all of them. And then, you know, when you start assembling those, 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 that deck pieces or anything that you are trying to build, furniture, whatever you want to, whatever you are trying to do, you end up noticing that you don't have enough knowledge. Seemingly, it's very easy, right? You look at the video, 30 minutes video explains everything. How to replace your sump pipe, sump pumps. How to get, you know, the molding, trimming done. Uh, you should use these, you know, screws instead of the other one, the galvanized screws and whatnot. It is rarely the case, right? So the definition of DIY effect is the IY effect occurs when a potential buyer considers meeting their own need rather than using professional help. Why does it work? Because it works because it's the buyer believes that it's cheapest and easiest option. So how is that relates to DevSecOps, right? So I'm gonna, you, you might have noticed that Docker file, that Docker file, the file itself. Any one of you guys developing their own Docker files, Docker images, I hope there are many. All right, couple. So Dockerfile has like 20 functions, like from, uh, run, copy, 20 statements that you can use. There aren't more than like 20, 25. So it should be very simple, right? And we expect developers as part of DevOps to own creation of a Dockerfile. It should be straightforward. They can watch videos, they can read, you know, learn about that on docker.com or other places. But it turns out that the this is Palo Alto Unit 42's research results. 99% of the Helm charts contain one or more insecure configuration. I'm not even talking about security. You know, insecure configuration issues. 91% of the images on public registries, Docker Hub, Google Container Registry, Quay, whatever, at least have one critical or high vulnerability. And most of them are configuration related. And guess what? In every presentation, that I, or every blog post that we see about Docker file, they say, okay, you should not be using root user to run your container. You should use a user statement. And I will say 75% of the Docker files that I've seen in my personal experience, they don't have that user line. By default, Docker image runs as root, which is against every single thing out there. You want to refer to PCI, SOX, whatever. They are all over the place. So the DIY effect tells us that it might be seemingly very easy, straightforward, easy to do, once you start getting that responsibility, which is not a security response, it's an ops responsibility. If you go back like 10 years ago, without the, the, the containers exist, became a, a thing. Uh, asking developers to install applications to production infrastructure, they have to go through installing RPMs or EXE files or whatever. That's an ops response, it's not secure at all. So shifting ops left based on this is failed already. Not even to mention that secure, we are asking security to be shifted left. So we fail drastically. I know this is an unorthodox view, we are gonna talk about that, that shifting left rarely works. And I know it's an anti-pattern. I had another slide in a presentation a while ago to talk about it extensively. But Dockerfile is a good example. I'm gonna give you another example. 
I have been in this space for 20 plus years, and I know how to write SQL code, SQL structure query language, right? And you can go to Google, and you see that developers are writing a lot of SQL queries that are killing production infrastructure. This, is, this has nothing to do with security. We are asking developers, Java developer, Python, Ruby, whatever, to own writing a query, which is very simple, very easy, think about the IY effect, but we want them to write straightforward queries, just select from one table and join a couple tables and whatnot, and they do all kinds of mistakes. Increases time settings without investigating, right? They just wanna solve something on a different level which is going to hurt production even more. They were going to talk about like in a database that are just simple spreadsheets, right? This is, a, this is the only slide that I have memes, just so you know. I'm not gonna bother you with those. Um, you know, what is this? Yeah, uh, no indexes, no where, where closes. And how many of you have seen this? I mean, I can talk to a lot of folks and it can quickly turn into a group therapy about you know, how SQL was used incorrectly, right? There are no indexes on the tables. And this meme is explaining a lot of the concerns of frustrations around just SQL. And this has nothing to do with the DevSecOps. When you realize that developer will never change their bad ways and follow your wise advice. So we have seen for last 15, maybe 20 plus years that developers were not good enough in understanding some simple uh, additional responsibilities with SQL, we have seen that. Now we are seeing with the Docker file, which is an ops responsibility. So the point is, do it yourself quickly becomes DIY, developer impose yikes, in my opinion. You ask more stuff from developers, you end up getting a lot more complications. And there's a good reason for that. We are overloading developers by doing shift left. They already have a lot of stuff that they need to take care of. They have to satisfy functional requirements, performance requirements, SQL statements, et cetera, and you are now asking them to own the security aspects of the operation by simply adopting some of the popular blog posts out there because X, it worked in X startup, right? And I have an answer for that. You know, in order for that not to fall into that pitfall, that owning, uh, giving uh, responsibility of creating a Docker file or the container images uh, to developers, there's a new and emerging standard. Not sure if how many of you heard, heard this, this term before, but there's called, uh, content, uh, it's called Zero Trust Containerization, called Build Packs. And Build Packs is a CNCF project. So you can effectively point Build Packs to your source code repository that is in a compilable state, say a Java project that can be compiled. You get that Java, for example, Java source repository, convert to a Java, uh, a Docker image. I, wanna, I don't want to call it, sir. I don't want to call it Docker image. I want to call it container image. And you can use CNCF build packs, but you are not limited to that. You can use Red Hat's S2I, which is source the image. Red Hat has a tool that you point at Python repository. You point at like you know um, Java repository. You end up getting a, a, a container image. Or if you want to do language specific container images, you can use Cov from Google that converts a Go source library, source repository into a container image. Or you can use JIB. If you have a Java, you can use JIB, J-I-B. So let me ask you this. If you have this option that you can automatically convert a source repository into a container image, why would you make yourself exposed to DIY effect by asking this to go by developers, right? And Google Cloud Build Packs has been around for three years. Google is one of the biggest innovators of our industry, and they have been pushing for this for three years plus. Actually, three, close to three years. Right? There is also Shipwright IO that you can magically convert your source image to a container image. So one of the first things that I emphasize, I want to emphasize throughout these slides, is if you have a tool that can work magically or automatically, try to invest some time to reduce the overloads on those developer community. Don't ask them to own Docker file because it's gonna make things um, go bad. Um, I have two observations. The first one was the DIY effect. Now I wanna share my observations around why are we doing shift left in the way that we are doing, which is a conventional way of like asking them, asking developers to do a lot of stuff. As you know, shift left is about doing things earlier in the development life cycle, right? 
So we kind of mentioned this already, but if you're going to ask developers to help with security, let's take a look at the building blocks and common jargon or terminology around what we are trying to do over here and what are their meanings. And one of the first things that you have to know is that you have to understand the common theme that the CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exploit, uh, exploitability, exposure, and common weakness and enumerations. So how many of you heard, I just want to see hands, uh, CWSS? Four or five. How many of you know CVSS? Like five times more, ten times more. CVSS is Common Vulnerability uh, Scoring System. CWSS is Common Weaknesses uh, Scoring System. So when you talk about, when you look at the left um, over here, Common Vulnerability Exposures are actually verified vulnerabilities that has a CVSS attached to them just to get them scaled, you know, uh, uh, rated properly, and they are on third party. Third party code meaning open source libraries or external proprietary code and whatnot. And you can do source, source composition analysis and generate S-bomb. There's a little line over here. We're going to talk about that later, most likely. But if you go to CWE, common weakness enumeration is a weakness. It is not a vulnerability. And you can grade them using CWSS, and it only happens on your first party code. Not many people are aware of first party, third party distinction. If you are compiling your applications, if you are using Java language as an example, you will end up getting downloading 70% 70 70 of packages from the internet. Uh, that, that's your third party. Less than most likely 10 to 20% of your code is actually your first party, if you're lucky. That's my best optimist optim, op, uh, guess. So the first party issues are rated as C, with CWE, and they can only be weaknesses because we cannot properly validate them or verify them. It, they are just theory at that stage. The vulnerabilities are CVEs. And in order to identify those CVEs and CWEs, let's take a look at the Pareto rule, right? So 80% uh, of the results come from 20% of the actions, right? So if you go and replace 20% of the actions with SAS, you will end up getting, sorry, next you will end up getting 80% of the results, which are, using SAS tooling, you can get CVEs and CWEs, first party code issues and third party code issues. But guess what, there are a lot of false positives. I would say 70 plus percent false positive rate. If you spend, in order to have a DAST dynamic application secure testing, you have to have your CI and CD ready so that your application can automatically deploy to a QA or lower environment and Possibly, and hopefully you have a database backend that is supporting all the user access and uh, sample data. So you can do automation. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort in order to have the DAST application, dynamic application security testing done. And it's going to end up giving you 20% of the outcome, which is only first party CWEs. So we talk about first party issues versus third party issues, CWSS weaknesses versus CVSA, which are vulnerabilities. So we spent a lot of time doing the DAS infrastructure up and ready, which is going to only give us first party issues with a lot of question marks. In my personal opinion, DAS is overrated. It is important, but it's overrated. And I was gonna make this statement, but I attended another uh, co uh, colleague over here yesterday, I attended his, his speech. Uh, he also made very similar statement. He has a slide that the DAS is not needed. So DAS is not needed if you are lacking the capability or bandwidth to have that SAS and other pieces ready. DAS is overrated because of this, this Pareto diagram. You have to spend a lot of time and you still end up having a lot of issues and false positive rate is very, very high. So um, the anti-pattern is that it's a common response to a recurring problem that is usually ineffective and risk being highly counterproductive. So let's talk about the shift left, the conventional standard shift left. So if you look at very high level, on a very high level, uh, life cycle stages of your coding software development life cycle, right? Plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, and monitor. And in the past and currently, we have the dev teams responsible for like plan to test, kind of like, you know, it's gray, it might include release, deploy, but you know, mostly on the left. And we used to have risks typically identified at the later stages of that SDLC, right? 
We identify them at the, you know, with the tool that we deploy on the uh, 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 runtime infrastructure or production infrastructure. All those risks became, used to become visible on the later stages. And the subject, uh, security subject matter experts were primarily responsible for all of these uh, risks, right? So just remember, the shift left is about doing things early in the development life cycle. So we start seeing those security risks becoming much more vis visible because of the, some of the advanced tools that you might be throwing into the pipeline, SAS tools, DAS tools, or SCA tools, whatever. Those risks becoming very easy to spot on. Again, with the caveat that their false positive rate is very high. So you expect developers to understand SAS, SCA, DAS, thread modeling to the degree that they can be confident and comfortably execute those things. When you have this shift left pattern you know, shown to you, remember the DIY effect. Don't ask, don't overload developers with additional responsibilities. Remember the DIY effect, remember SQL. So instead of having them, the you know, identification of those just becoming a shifted left, instead of asking them to respond for like remediation or control aspects of that, those risks, you know, this is the anti pattern We are shifting security subject matter experts left. So the real shift left should look like this. Both risks and security subject matter experts shifted left, not just the developers. So they co-own those risks, not just the developers. You might, you might want to call them DevSecOps architects, you may want to call them security champions, but they have to be very you know, comfortable in CI, CD aspects of the operation. And typically, you don't see that many people good at that. And my wife is a nurse. Um, I just want to give you this very high level metaphor, which may not be 100% applicable. We are asking nurses to do brain surgery. We should ask brain surgeons to do, like, medical first response. I wouldn't call them medical, like, first response, but first, you know, first aid. But, you know, we are asking a lot more complicated issues to be owned by developers. Right? So it is, it is risky to have them own so many of these issues because they were going to get buried under. So you have to do shift left. Instead of asking developers to do more security, ask security to do more developments. So what, what I have been trying to do is train security folks with policy escrow rigos, you know, the uh, whole, uh, whole, uh, whole policy escrow pipelines uh, practices, and have them train on the development instead of developing, uh, asking developers to be trained on how to develop secure code. That's one approach that might be working, but in my opinion, it's anti-pattern. The real emphasis should be on asking develop, uh, security folks to own more developments. And <laughs> there, are, there are a bunch of reasons. One good example is, not sure if you know this, 77 new CVs discovered in average in 2023. This is the actual graph that I captured like 10 days ago. 77 new CVs get uh, disclosed on average. You can't fight this. It's too much. You, don't, you need dedicated teams to own this. So this, uh, you know, we can all talk about the details of this, but you know, 77 is a higher, it's getting higher, high, you know, the velocity is getting increased, increased every passing day. Most of it is like, you know, not exploitable. I just wanna make that distinction because I have a slide to talk about that. Just because there's a CVE, that doesn't mean that you have, it's exploitable and you have to fix it. There's a VEX discussion at the end of this presentation. So, Get good luck with fighting that CVs, that, you know, that number of CVs. Uh, so you have to do, you have to improve your precision guesswork skills. You, you have to precise the guess which ones to prioritize. Even as a subject matter expert on security practices, I can't give you a clear guidance on how to prioritize it. Not alone myself, I can't do it, and we are asking developers to fix all of them. Fix all CVs that we disclose throughout the pipeline. It's not gonna fly. So, and it, it, just to you know, confirm my point. Oh, 20 minutes. So we have uh, the data breach investigation report published by Verizon every, every, every year. And they have this statement starting in 2019 with slanted bar charts, DBIR, has tried to make the point that the only certain thing about the information security is nothing is certain. Hence, the precision guesswork. You have to assume that a lot of stuff is not accurate. 
a lot of stuff that we discover is not going to be, have to be fixed as a vulnerability. So shift left in conventional DevOps or DevSecOps is uh, security controls earlier in the ap application lifecycle. Shift left typically understood as asking developers to own more of the security. Uh, it kind of asked them to do the CI CD, which we don't like. So security as code and policy as code. I mean, these are like typically you know, overlapping definitions, but I just want to give you a, a, a good clear guidance on which ones to call security as code and which ones to call policy as code. So if you have a security as code, that is a remediation, a detective controls. So you have the risk management, you have detective controls and preventive controls. Detective controls, like you detect the issue and you can kind of ask this to be owned by some of the, or co-owned by the developers. SAS, SCA, DAS, CW, and CV detections SBOM and VEX responsibilities, containers with build packs can be classified as uh, security as code. What is policy as code on the other, you know, uh, if, you, if, if you wonder? It is giving, going to give you a pass or fail decision. Say, as an example, if Docker file is running as root, it's a pass or fail. You're not getting a vulnerability that is high, you're not getting a weakness that is low rated. You are getting pass or fail decision. It can be also classified as toll gating. It can also be, you know, you can use or rely on rego policies, OPA rego policies. Uh, and build packs and zero trust containers are also fall under this, this policy S code. So in, in, in a dream world, we would like to see, um, you know, source, build, and delivery uh, stages um, in a pipeline, one pipeline doing that, you know, continuous integration, building that artifact another pipeline doing that, or another parallel step in that pipeline doing continuous delivery, we would like to see security as code pipeline as a second shadow additional pipeline owned, co-owned by other people, and policy as code only owned by DevSecOps. So Dev still owns continuous integration. Dev uh, uh, security people owns security S code and policy S code. And security S code is in the middle. You can co-own that piece, depending on the size of the organization. But policy S code has to be owned by a separate entity, a dedicated team, which I'm going to be talking about the zero trust management model in coming slides. So again, some of these views that I expressed over here are personal opinion based on my personal observations that I've seen in, the, in, in my previous uh, 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 employments. And I was coming over here to fight you know, against those uh, common uh, conventional uh, DevOps uh, um, definition. But to my luck, April 11, 2023, Zero Trust Measure Model 2.0 launched, and they also added a new function called Secure Application Development and Deployment Workflow. Right? It's a new function. Um, I, I know you might not be able to see it, but there are like four maturity levels. There is initiative, then is initial, that is, uh, I guess, advanced, that is optimum. I forgot this, the middle one in the middle. But there are like four maturity levels that you might be able to execute. So the, the advanced level definition of that new function is this. Agency uses distinct and coordinated teams for development, security, and operations while removing developer access to production environment for code deployment. So zero trust and DevSecOps up until April 11, 2023, was seemingly contradicting to each other, but now they are saying that, that you have to have a different team, dedicated distinct team, to own security aspects of your operation. If you want to target advanced level zero trust maturity, right? So if you go back to previous slides, security as code and policy as code uh, in zero trust maturity journey, that the traditional I'm sorry, yeah, the first one is traditional, the emergency model, the, the second one is initial, and the third one is advanced. Let's take a look at the first three levels of zero trust measure to model 2.0 levels. You might have a dev team owning security as code and policy as code, but in my opinion, good luck with that, right? It's a DIY effect issue. Uh, if you're in the initial phase, which is kind of also can be classified as trust but verify phase, right? You are going to have developers and security folks owning security as code, but subject matter experts in security space owning policy as code, no questions. That has to be owned by another person, another team. And if you are aiming for advanced level of zero trust maturity journey, 
based on CISA's guidelines. You want to have a dedicated team both owning security escort and policy escort. That's the advanced level of owning what responsibility that we have in the pipeline. So that is also kind of treating security automation as a first class citizen. You want to have dedicated groups, dedicated individuals who are fluent in codifying things in pipeline, right? That's being a first class citizen. So trust nothing is the goal. That's the whole North Star of zero trust wisdom, right? We don't want to trust anyone. And you just want to have toll gates and everything. You want to have policy as code guiding all of your pipelines. It's going to be a longer journey, but you have to have teams, responsible, dedicated teams responsible for policy as code piece. And your CICD steps are tied to that gate, toll gate, which is dictated by the GRC teams in your organization, governance, risk, and compliance functions. So uh, you can also, this is an example of race symmetrics, you know, responsibilities, uh, accountable, consult, and informed. This is a classical shift left, race symmetrics. Uh, you see that so many, so many of those SAS, DAS, SCA functions, threat modeling are owned by the developers, and accountable teams are typically security folks. And consulted, I put the DevSecOps architects over there, informed is the CISO. This has to change with the advanced level maturity to this. So you have security teams responsible for SAS, DAS, SCA in advanced level maturity. So uh, this race matrix is an example, you know, as a sample, you might wanna, you know, use a slight variations of this, but at the end of the day, I suggest that you have a, a race matrix showing who does what. All these functions that you have seen in that, the DevSecOps uh, infinity loop, the one that I first showed, the uh, DOD version, there are like 14 milestones in that life cycle, 14. Starting from the threat modeling that goes all the way into like deploying, monitoring analysis and audit. All of those 14 functions have to be owned or visible in a race matrix like this one. That's going to help you a lot. So uh, the, the reason why I call this coordinated chaos is we are fighting a war that is, that is not well defined. A lot of things are showing up. The, there are a lot of high velocity CVs, uh, you know, Disclosures are happening all the time. You can't control this with, you can't automate all day long. You're not gonna be able to control it properly. So the coordinated DevSecOps is, is a, a, a choreography in a way that it makes use of all the recent tools that are being developed by CISA and other folks. Um, the biggest problem, if biggest issue with the, you know, uh, the DevSecOps is that there are, we are fighting uh, against a lot of false positives, a very high level of false positives. There are two things that are start becoming a very, very, very important in our arsenal. Um, and I call it reducing false positive noise using VEX. Um, you, you might want to create, starting you know, from your source repository, create a store, your SBOM, which is your software bill of materials, right in your source repository. And also add a VEX file, which is um, a new format you know, launched by CISA folks uh, a couple of years ago. It can give you an exception handling mechanism to identify which vulnerabilities are have to be fixed. VEX defines four states, not affected, affected, uh, fixed, or under investigation. So for example, you might have a log4j or log4shell vulnerability that is exploitable if you deploy it publicly, but if you deploy it behind a firewall within that context, it's not exploitable or whatever the control mechanism you have, it's not exploitable. So you might wanna ex, you know, put that decision or exception, definition of that exception into your source repository in a VEX file format so that your SAS scanners or DAS scanners are ignoring that because your application within that context is not exploitable. Um, that is the very first step used you know, for false positive noise because that's a fight that you don't wanna take because you're gonna lose that because there's going to be a lot of issues that are vulnerabilities that are in there that doesn't have to be, uh, or cannot be exploited. The second thing that starts becoming important is that though, in addition to MVD, which gives you a static definition of CVSS, there's a new emerging standard called EPSS, Exploitability Prediction Scoring System. It used to look at 14 different parameters, now I guess look, looking at 50 plus parameters, that's from, from first.org. It's a machine learning driven data that gives you an updated priority rating. So for example, log4j, log4shell, is like 9.8, if I remember correctly, CVSS, but at the time that it was launched, and it stayed the same, right? But EPSS score gives you a predicting, prediction number between zero and one, so log4shell might be 0.48 tomorrow, 
but it might be 0 0.10 today because of the, some other things that happen. They keep updating their scoring. So you may want to tie your system into EPSS scoring system so that you, know, you dynamically prioritize things properly. And you might also know KEV, which is known exploited vulnerabilities, again from C uh, CISA, into your vulnerability prioritization schema. If you are not doing EPSS on KEV, if you are not doing VEX, you will be fighting a coordinary chaos and you will fail because of the number of vulnerabilities that are being disclosed. Right? You have to have this false positive noise reduction techniques or tools that are readily available in open source that are being uh, you know, advertised by um, CISA and other folks. I guess I have a lot of time. So this is EPSS, this is Kev. How many minutes? Okay, cool. So, um, and I wanna show you the previous slide I forgot to mention. The, in my zero trust measures model, it talks about uh, removing developer access to production, right? This is one of the advanced level asks for zero trust measures model. How are you going to remove developer access to production? You know, you have CICD, your CICD system that runs, for example, Jenkins, that has access to production credentials that because it has to deploy that application, jar file or whatever, into production, and it has to have admin rights or root access to deploy that because that's what this Jenkins does, what the, uh, the CICD CD piece does. Let me just introduce you the pull versus push model discussion. Pull model, actually we are using push model right now. You have your production credentials running in, protected or not, in your CI CD that gives access to your Jenkins server, as an example, to write stuff to production that's pushing from CI CD infra to production infra. Pull model reverses that direction and your production credentials never leave your production infra there is an agent running inside your Kubernetes or pet world, you know, if you're using pet world, over there. That agent constantly pulls your CI/CD infra and asks for, is there an update? Is there an update? So you, all you need is a read-only access to your, say, Git repository, read-only access to your Jenkins infrastructure. So the credentials, if you move the credentials from Jenkins, CI/CD infra to production and reverse the flow, you automatically eliminate the need for developers to have production access because your production has an access, which is mostly it's gonna need only read-only access, to talk back to or upstream Git repository or artifact repositories to download files. That's it. Why are we giving access, right access to CICD infra? So pool model should be preferred in order to achieve that advanced level zero trust maturity levels. So key takeaways, uh, takeaways and what to apply. So except the fact that DevSecOps on a very high level is an effort to coordinate chaos. You can't, you can't fight that if you don't understand this properly. It's a chaos, you have to be very agile and dynamic and change directions in any given time. GRC and development teams learn how to live with precision guesswork. It's not like, you know, there's going to be a lot of guesses has to happen. Uh, DIY effect is a real phenomenon. Devs can't tackle this alone. They need security SMEs to step up their games and own so many things. Uh, smart and proper DevSecOps implementation improves your zero trust posture, which we kind of talked about it already. False positive reduction with VEX and further optimization with EPSS and KEV is critical, right? That's gonna help you with coordinated chaos. Use pull model for advanced level zero trust. And q and And I just so you know, I haven't used ChatGPT for my presentations. <laughs> Questions? Uh, please go ahead uh, through the microphone, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Not quite. All right. Um, so this is all interesting stuff. I think uh, we've been developing the same uh, the pipelines. I, I'm at a I run the AppSec team at a major FI, and we've been developing largely with the same, mm, I guess, thesis. How have security champions, satellites, or any of that factored into uh, what you've built here? Um, the subject matter experts that I was referring to, you can classify them as security champions, you can classify them as security diplomats or ambassadors, but they have to be very fluent in these principles. Yeah. That's 
that's kind of must have, but we have seen that it's those school championship programs are failing because you cannot find enough interested people. So ultimately, in my case, in our case, you know, if you have like 10,000 plus developers, you will end up having less than 10 people that are good enough to help the other organization. So that's not gonna be enough for your security champions. So there's a, there's a gray area over there. So I can, I can share some notes um, after the talk. Uh, we've had success. We have, I think, uh, 2,000 developers, and uh, right now our population of champions is around 150. We've largely been dangling carrots, like train, compensated training and things like that, but that's been pretty effective for us. Cool, perfect, thank you. Go ahead. Quick question. Um, one of the reasons for developers to have access to the production is for a debugging purpose. So how do you uh, handle in that case? That, that's, uh, I guess that's well defined within the Zero Trust framework. You wanna have like that uh, privilege granted when, they, when it's needed, not all the time. The identity piece of Zero Trust, you don't wanna give, you don't wanna give blank check to developers that is available to them all the time. You wanna give them production access that if there is a troubleshooting exercise or if there's an incident happening. Right? You don't want to give permanent, persistent access to anyone in general, not just, mention, uh, not just developers. That is temporary and uh, uh, like uh, on a need-to-need need basis. Go ahead. How do you build ROI to justify moving your security team to make them more developer focused because that's gonna require retraining, rebuilding that team. And in a lot of cases, you don't have solid metrics that can show um, that, you know, that, that you can justify spending this much extra dollar to make your security team that's more focused on a risk management framework to turn them into developers. Um, what I've seen, you know, that's the unorthodox piece that I was referring to. Uh, in, in, in a lot of places, people are struggling and trying to do the, go with the default way of like training developers, and I am not seeing success. That's my justification, right? That this, it's not gonna be quantifiable in ROI way, but I understand what you're saying. It's a very good question, by the way. But I, I don't see that that is being successful. You might be seeing, hearing that from vendors that it says, oh, it's successful, we train all of them and reduce the number of CVs and whatnot. I'm not seeing that. This way, you might have a higher chance because you are bringing bigger guns that are subject matter experts to that space. And to my opinion, it's not that hard to train uh, security SMEs. If you look at the triangle, like you know, we have 10,000 Java developers, 1,000 architects, and 100 project managers, and 10 security people. I have one minute left. That triangle tells me that they are, they are easier to, to train. Any other question? All right, thank you everyone.